I'm going to show you another brilliant game by Bobby Fischer, the great American world champion, played in Herzegnovi 1970, this extraordinary blitz tournament that he won with 19 out of 22, a phenomenal score against such players as Tal, Petrosian, Bronstein, Korchnoi, Hort, Ryshevsky, and so on, and a, a fantastic field. And, well, I've already mentioned the names Tal and Petrosian. They had reputations as really superb blitz players. So for Fischer to win it in such style was incredible. So I want to show you another game, and this one is against Viktor Korchnoi. Now, Korchnoi was the only player to beat him in the tournament, actually. It was a double round tournament. I'm not going to show you Fischer's loss. I'm going to show you the game in which he defeated Korchnoi. Now, Korchnoi is known as the King's Indian Killer, and Fischer played the King's Indian against him. So let's see what happened. I should mention that uh, it was said that although this is a blitz tournament, that means five minutes for all the moves, Fischer barely used more than two and a half minutes in every single game. He played with such speed and by all accounts that was absolutely typical of him. Very fast blitz player. Well, indeed in his classical games he was also a very fast player, such a fluent player so, and with played with such strategic clarity as well. And that we're going to see in this game too. Mainline King's Indian. So the knight comes out to force a decision in the middle of the board as there's pressure here. So that induces d5 closing the position. And these kind of positions, Korchnoi was really in his element. He loved this space advantage. And, and I mean, throughout his career, he played various different ways against the King's Indian. He in later years liked to play with knight e1 and bishop e3 and and made that into well a, a really dangerous weapon this stage he was playing knight d2 now the point of that is one of the points is that it stops knight h5 and can sometimes prepare to swing over to the queen side sometimes to b3 sometimes if you're lucky it gets in on c4 after um after white breaks with c5. Fischer responded with c5 himself. Uh, well, he thought that this was the best way to counter this system, to slow up white's queenside play. But it does mean that potentially that d6 pawn is a bit weaker, and of course, White is going to be able to open the b-file quite quickly. Anyway, let's see how things develop. Knight e8. So in this case, that's appropriate to defend the d6 pawn and keep this bishop's diagonal open. Now, b6, you don't really want to recapture with the d-pawn. Um, after this game, Korchnoi actually just took on c5 immediately in another game uh, like this. And knight b3, hoping to try, trying to get in on a5 at some moment. But anyway, in this game, he played rook b1 and f5. So black's kingside expansion starts. And now one doesn't have to play f3 here. It's possible to play a4, but cautionally play f3. Bolstering the e pawn, then f4. Well, we have a typical King's Indian scenario with white trying to open up the queen side and basically traveling in this direction and sometimes looking at the d6 pawn as well and black advancing on the king side and heading in this direction. So who's going to be quicker? That's the question. A5 from Korchnoi. Well, this all looks very logical to break up pawn chain and rook f6. Now that rook move isn't just about attacking, it may swing to these squares, but it also defends the d6 pawn too. 
And here, Korchner exchanged on c5, which Fischer criticised afterwards. He thought it was a terrible mistake because it makes it very, as we'll see, it makes it difficult for White to get the initiative on the queen side. Um, a better move looks like queen b3. And the point is this. You trade on b6 and then on c5 and you can see that without the a pawn then it's possible for white to use the b6 square. Now that's this isn't necessarily bad for black but you can see that it makes a massive difference. Certainly it's going to be very hard for black to break through on the king side while a, a queen trade is possible for example and, and there's you know, immediate pressure on the d6 pawn. And, you know, one could contemplate moves such as knight b5 as well. I mean, black is solid enough here, but white is also okay. But just compare with what happens in the game. So Korchnoi, perhaps a bit casually, took on c5. Remember, it is a blitz game. And then played knight b3. And rook g6. So black's attack is a bit slower, but it's on its way. Already, we're ready for g4. And here Fischer played g4. He actually thought that, well, h5 is possible and, and, and maybe better. But anyway, g, g4 is not a bad move. And the idea is, well, let's, let's see what happens if white just continues with knight b5. Trying to, you know, the, the idea is if, if the knight is batted away, then now there's a, the b6 square is available. But of course, we ignore the knight and just play g3. And after white closes, then there's a very obvious sacrifice on h3, followed by the queen coming in, and white is utterly lost. So this is the danger. And that's why white really has to trade on g4. And knight takes so already the knight assumes a really dangerous position looking at h2 but also these squares as well. Fisher thought here that bishop f3 was the best defense but well black's initiative continues with king h8 and, and possibly knight g8 and uh, perhaps bringing the queen over. But Korshnoi played rook f3, and his idea was after rook h6, attacking this pawn, to play h3, and clearly he thought, okay, I've held things up for the time being, the rook prevents any sacrifices on h3. But matters aren't so clear. For, for a start, knight g6 comes, and that could gain a tempo. But also the knight has another destination in mind. King steps out of, the, out of the way. So now this is threatened because pin is broken. So the knight retreats. And now bishop e1. So that at least covers the h4 square. So if the knight came here, then it would be exchanged off. Not that that would be bad for black, actually. Just to, to get that bishop would not be a bad idea. But instead of that, Fischer has another idea in mind and this is brilliant remember this is a blitz game knight h8 so he's bouncing the knight wrapped here to g5 looking at these squares well if you're a, a seasoned king's indian player then well you might well know this game already but you'll i'm sure you'll know this maneuver it's occurred in 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 many famous king's indian uh, attacks on the king and, and worth knowing about. And it's very hard to defend against this. Well, threat knight g5. Fischer says h4 would have held out a little longer, but I mean, that is such an ugly move, it has to be said. Um, the pawn is loose. The g4 square is, is vulnerable, it is available. So after bishop f8, um, perhaps rook here, that creates a little bit of room. And sometimes bishop e7, well, I think ultimately this must be lost. Um, 
the other thing is that if the knight tries to come back to defend on the king's side, then that pawn is loose as well. It's just a, a very, very difficult position for white, and, and in a blitz game, I think, basically just lost. Knight g5, here we go. And now Fisher is building for the final attack, so there's a because of the pin, there's a threat to take on h3. And, well, king h1 would have been more tenacious. But then just a rook b8, black can actually play on the other side of the board as well. Um, it's an unpleasant um, situation for white, because if the knight moves, you trade on, on b1. And once again, the, the a pawn is threatened. In the meantime, you know, perhaps the rook is coming into b4. It, it's not nice for white at all. He's under pressure on both sides of the board. So, rook g6 just played. Korchnoi very understandably stepped away towards his pieces, but then this sacrifice really wasn't too difficult to calculate. And here, uh, Fisher admitted afterwards, he said, at this moment, my hand hovered over white's pawn on e4. But the last second, at the last second, I realized that knight takes e4 is answered by queen takes e4. Of course, he's looking at this checkmate, but queen e4 instead would provide an escape square for the king. Um, so he realized just in time and instead played knight g4, which is a winning move. Check. Now the king doesn't want to step into the line of the rook, so that got taken. And here Korchnoi resigned. Queen is attacked. If it steps back, then the queen is coming to h4 and, well, let's say king here. And that is absolutely fatal. The king cannot escape. Um, or let's say queen comes to b2, then again queen h4 is fatal. And bishop h3. So once again, we see this strategic clarity from Fisher. This was just so straightforward. Route one. Uh, and really, it was basically, if I just return to this position here, one slip from Korchnoi, this move b takes c5, and suddenly it became very difficult to actually make progress on the queen side. So one slip and Fisher was in. Of course, there were ways for white to improve after that, but in blitz chess, the initiative is everything. And Fisher had that initiative and prosecuted the attack absolutely beautifully. So this, I'll be looking at uh, more games from the Herzog Novi Blitz Tournament, more games from Fisher. And um, if you want to check out the Fisher playlist, do click on the tab above and indeed the Korchnoi playlist as well. You can see some great stuff there. Thanks very much for watching.